My name is Julie Phillips. I'm a Thule elk biologist, and I've been following and tracking the elk, studying the elk for over 30 years throughout much of their range in California. The Thule elk reserve is a captive elk herd, and to me, that is inhumane in the 21st century. To have elk in a situation where they, they can't go free roaming across the landscape, they can't find possibly access to fresh water at times of the year, to, to disrupt the social behaviors of those complex herds or subherds within that captive area is really not what we should be doing um, anywhere in California where the herds are, but especially in a national park like Point Reyes National Seashore. The Thule elk form different subherds, and throughout much, much of the year, the cows are kind of off by themselves, the cows and calf groups, and then the bulls would be in groups. But then the rut season happens in the fall, and it gets really complex. So there'll be, usually be a dominant bull that's constantly being challenged by other bulls. There'll be the subordinate bulls that are off to the side that kind of follow the group. And then there's the cow-calf group that's monitored by this dominant bull. So it's a very dynamic situation. And in a captive setting, that becomes even more complex because animals simply can't shift. They can't shift within that range. So if you're a subordinate bull and you've got a dominant bull and you've got a captive area, to me, that dynamic becomes very complex. So what happens to a bull that's not, there's not enough water sources dried up and sometimes in case, some of the cases it looks like in that captive area, they're almost like mud holes with very little free, you know, free flowing water. So then those dominant bulls could dominate that area and keep the other animals, males and females, away from those, especially in the fall, which is occurring right now at Point Reyes National Seashore. That's a very troublesome situation. I've just never seen wildlife drinking out of mud holes. In every place in the field, I've been in the different herds that we've studied, there's always free flowing water and those little riparian corridors. And what's important is not just the water, but the plants that grow along those little riparian corridors. The animals will feed that, they'll drink and feed, and they'll be shifting within that. So you have to have adequate water supplies. In some of the herds, there's huge lakes or reservoirs, and they're always nearby those, and they'll shift down to those. So you have to have regular water sources year round that aren't mud holes. First off, we don't have 5,000 elk at places like Point Reyes, like 700 and some, so that's a much smaller number separated into different groups. So to have 5,000 cattle is absolutely irresponsible. I mean, that's a lot of cattle in those pastoral lands. And obviously by the degraded nature of that landscape, that's some of the most degraded habitat I've ever seen in all my studies, and I've seen some pretty sad stuff. That is just terrible. So those animals and the cattle will just sit there and roam in that little area and just feed every ounce of it all the way down through the soil. So in those big perennial bunch grasses where they'll eat the, the stuff that's above the surface, they'll also go down and eat all the root structures below the surface. Whereas the elk will move, they're discriminate feeders, they'll kind of shift. They'll browse and, you know, woody stuff and then they'll, they'll keep moving through the areas. So as they shift, they don't take something until it's all the way down, they shift throughout the landscape. Now the elk are constantly shifting within their range. So even over 20, I do 24 hour watches, they would be shifting throughout that time. They'd feed for a little while, graze and browse and they'd shift. They'd lay down in an area and bed down for quite a while and they'd get up and just kind of move. So it was a constant movement going on. They're, you know, they're not used to being confined. They need to be free roaming and they can move over a fairly large area. I would do 24 hour watches and I'd be out there sometimes for two or three days. And so then I would set up my equipment to kind of track them or so on and they would constantly be moving. So I'd have to load up my stuff, kind of pack stuff up again. If I was doing 24 hour watches during the night, I'd be moving at night even. So they would bed down for a few hours, but then all of a sudden I go, oh shoot, I have a night scope and they would be moving. So I'd have to pick up all my stuff and keep moving throughout that, you know, that period of time. So they're constantly moving and shifting across the landscape. And that's what they do, they're free roaming. The Thule elk went from 500,000 Thule elk in the state of California in their historic range down to probably less than 20. So it went through what's called a population bottleneck. We lost all those gene alleles. We lost all those elk. And so we lost that genetic diversity, those gene alleles. And then as the numbers slowly began to increase, you know, over a very long period of time from the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, so on, um, the elk were, different herds were established throughout the state. And then a group was put at Point Reyes of, what, 10 elk originally. 
and they were in a captive situation. So you've got the original elk that are put into a captive situation and there's no um, ability to move out of that area, you're further causing stress to that species in terms of genetics by not allowing the movement of other animals within to, into that herd. So that causes further genetic gene allele concerns. We're worried about the genetic diversity because you don't have other animals coming into those groups. So they should be free roaming across the entire state and they're not. But especially in a national park, if you're gonna have two or three herds, you should allow them to move within those herds. So different males would move to different times of the year. They'd shift into different areas. So again, having a captive herd in a very small area that's gone year after year during the breeding season, it doesn't seem responsible from a genetic perspective. You want to have new uh, males moving into those areas and other bulls able to shift out of those areas. The cow-calf group would also shift. The males may shift between different subherds. So elk just don't have one main herd. They often have many subherds. And in the larger areas, you would see the bulls shift to different areas you know, in response to the breeding season. The key to the long-term genetic health of the elk is to allow connectivity between the different herds including Point Reyes National Seashore. So that means establishing herds um, outside the park that can be connected to the herds within Point Reyes. So maybe in you know, some of the lands adjacent to that would be incredible, but that's what really concerns me is there's no connectivity between the different herds. And you need to have that movement for the long-term genetic health of those populations. Well, just think of, think of an animal that's been captive for most of its life. Those little calves grow and eventually become bulls or cows. And then they're suddenly get access to this freedom. And so they've lost kind of their social group, their social dynamics. So oftentimes in wild herds that are free roaming, the bulls will leave the herd, the cow-calf group during the non-breeding season. And so for this group, they've all been kind of stuck there together in that captive setting. So it would seem like a bull that would get out of there would kind of think, okay, who's out here and what's going on? That would be quite complex especially now you've got, the other situation would be the pastoral, the pastoral lands with the ranchers. And who knows what's going on at night if they're being harassed or chased. Maybe he's confused because he ran into something at night. But you know, the dynamics of those groups in those pastoral lands must be very complex, especially the pressure they're under from people chasing them and so on. To me, I think they're being chased behind the scenes. See, and that's the other part that really is upsetting is that elk will not go out of their way to ruin a fence. The only time we've seen fences ruined is when the elk are driven into the fences, and that's often a practice used on public or private lands to kill the elk. They'll drive them, they'll actually chase them into the fences. They get caught in the fences, or they try to jump it and they get caught. And I had one that flipped over the fence and got stuck in the barbed wire. So that's because they were being chased. So it's not natural for them um, unless they're being harassed. Point, Point Reyes National Seashore, first off, they should remove all the fencing and remove the cattle. But if that's not going to happen, then they need to change all the fencing so it's all wildlife friendly fencing. So the elk can move through those areas and all other wildlife as well. So the elk are really kind of an indicator species for all the other wildlife. They're absolutely critical for all the other species to be able to move across that landscape. So to me, the cattle should be removed, all the fencing should be removed, and where there is fencing, it should be wildlife friendly fencing. But that captive elk herd should be released from that captive area immediately, and then again, the fence is all removed. Barbed wire should be illegal in a national park. I cannot believe in the 21st century there's barbed wire and that kind of fencing in the national park. Obviously the cattle ranchers are driving that conversation. But again, they've outstayed their leases. They've outstayed, they've been paid to leave the land. Those pastoral lands are heavily degraded. It's time for a new focus and that would be to remove all the fencing where they need actual fencing for some reasons and there would be maybe there's habitat restoration they're gonna do. That would be wildlife, friends, uh, wildlife friendly fencing only. I think what's really important at Point Reyes is the restoration of that native landscape. And this could be a model for the state in terms of taking those pastoral lands, removing the cattle, and allowing the tule to go in and do their job. And that is to help restore the native perennial bunch grasses, the native annual grasses, the herbaceous forbs, the little non-woody plants, the shrubs, the oaks, let the oaks regenerate in those areas where they've been degraded, and let the elk roam freely. And as they're doing that, they would help disperse those native plants and get rid of those non-native exotics. And that would be truly the most amazing example for people to study this whole concept of landscape ecology.
And that's clearly what's missing from Point Reyes National Seashore. It's just devastated land, especially in the pastoral lands. And the elk should be allowed to roam free. They should be able to restore that landscape. They should be able to initiate their behavioral, you know, things that are more natural to the natural environment. This concept that the National Park Service and other ranchers and so on, they're putting out the regenerative ranching, that cattle restore the native landscape is irresponsible and just simply not true. And I'm being on many different ranches, including national monument lands, private ranches, where there's heavy cattle grazing that has really destroyed the native landscape, it doesn't come back. They'll just keep taking it down because oftentimes, like at Point Reyes, they simply have too many cattle on the land. It cannot sustain that over 5,000 cattle in that particular area. And so they don't, there's no native plants, so there's no carbon sequestration. There's, they're not taking up carbon. They're not helping fight climate change. That's just irresponsible. You go out there, it's bone dry. So that means there's no plants above the ground that are native, and there's no root structures below the ground. It's all exotics. And again, it's, it's literally just lifeless. So the cattle will take every bit of both native and non-native plants until literally the landscape is barren, and that's what you see at Point Reyes. So actually, it's, got, it's adding to carbon, up, you know, producing more carbon, enhancing climate change. Those are all non-native exotic annual grasses. Maybe a few other plants that are non-native, but none of the native plants will come back until you get something like the elk that will help restore those and bring those back, you know, back to the, that area. Yeah, the tule elk evolved with the native landscape. And part of their job is to help maintain and restore the native landscape. So if we remove those non-native exotic cattle from that area, that land will eventually restore itself. It will, take, it will take stages to do that. But the elk moving through it, they'll help bring you know, seeds through, possibly through their hoofs. There's many different hypotheses about how that occur. But we've seen that in other areas. When the cattle are removed, eventually the perennial bunch grasses will come back, the annual grasses, the shrubs. In some areas that we've seen the oaks regenerating and where only the elk are allowed to graze and browse. And it, it, in one of the areas we observed, it was faster than any of us thought it would happen. So it's so devastated right now at Point Reyes, it's gonna take some time for that to occur, but the elk will do the job. There's not a doubt about it. In all my years, over 30 some years of, you know, tracking elk and looking at the different herds, I'm just stunned at how many cattle there are in California. You can drive along any freeway throughout the state and all you see in the landscape is cattle grazed lands. You can, it's almost impossible for the public to see native tule elk. And so in these places like Carrizo Plains National Monument or San Luis Reservoir or Point Reyes National Seashore, we really need to have a place where people can go to see their native endemic tule elk. Because the bottom line is the millions of cattle in the state, that's, you know, I understand that, especially if it's on private lands, but on public lands, it's a different situation. They do not belong on public lands. It's so important for the public and for people to realize that there are three categories of federal lands. There's restricted use lands, moderately restricted use lands, and multiple use lands. National Park Service is in the top category, which are restricted use lands. These are the most protected lands on earth. Point Reyes National Seashore is within that category. They are clearly violating that mission that they established many years ago when that that place was established. That mission statement says that that land should be restored to its natural processes and landscape, and the tule elk are part of that. So they need to let the tule elk and the other wildlife, both the plants and other animals and other organisms, the microorganisms, regenerate and restore that park to what it was meant to be. The ranchers are not part of the natural landscape. So if we want to talk about, you know, ranches have their place, and if you look at the state of California, much of the private public lands in California have cattle, but national parks, again, are the most protected lands on earth. That is not the place. And that's why when they created Point Reyes National Seashore, the plan was to phase out those ranching operations, restore the natural processes and systems that sustain those national parks at Point Reyes National Seashore. And that was the long-term vision. Why that has changed is really unclear. Obviously, people are lobbying but that park was created to eventually phase out those pastoral ranches and lands and allow the natural processes to take over. And we're at that moment in history and the public has clearly spoken out. The majority of what, over 90 some percent of the people that have commented on the general management plan and other, you know, other than now the proposed alternative that they've selected, it's clear that the public supports that becoming a national park 
with no cattle grazing. It's time for the ranchers to leave. They've had their time. They've been paid millions of dollars. And the elk should not be touched or killed to sustain cattle operations that are not sustainable. So California is the only state that has its own subspecies of North American elk, the Thule elk. It's a California endemic species found only in California. That means it should have a special status. And that means it should be protected on lands, public lands, especially national park lands. And those national park lands are part of the public trust doctrine. Those lands and the elk are held in trust for present and future generations. So the public trust doctrine needs to really be referred to in this situation. Again, it's so critical that this be protected because if those elk aren't protected at Point Reyes National Seashore, again, a national park, restricted use lands that are part of the public trust doctrine, then where will they be protected? We are not guaranteed that we'll have tule elk in California in the next century. I think it's very sad that people would say they don't care about the elk, but the bottom line is most of us do in California care about these elk. And that's why this group of people saved the last 20 elk back in the 1800s. Henry Miller on his ranch protected the last little group of 20 elk. And his ranchers literally protect them with guns. And this small group of people formed to protect the elk, reintroduce them into places like Point Reyes National Seashore as a national trust. Again, the public trust doctrine was important in this. They wanted to reestablish these herds for present and future generations. So we have an absolute responsibility to make sure these elk are protected forever. And so people don't get, you know, people can have their opinions, but that doesn't mean that's the right thing to do. These elk have a right to exist. And if we don't, then we're clearly in violation of the public trust doctrine and the right of California citizens to have this native endemic elk. We're in an ecological crisis. We're in a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis. And the bottom line is these native species are absolutely critical to protect the native landscape, to help sequester carbon, to help restore the native landscape. So people need to understand that this is extremely important we need to have our tule elk, we need to have our native landscape, and it's absolutely essential that we be protected. And for some politician to come in and say, you know, we don't care about the elk or this that, they should be voted out of office, to be honest. It is so important that this is, for this generation coming up, landscape ecology, restoration ecology is taught in almost every college and university now. Young people love this, the movement we've seen at Point Reyes of the young people rising up saying, this is important, this is what we want on our public lands. Those lands belong to them and they're held in trust for them and for future generations. Those people that are supporting these elk being killed on public lands will have to answer to that in their lifetime because these elk belong part of our nat natural ecosystems and especially in our national parks.